Got it? There it is. Okay. This is a call, the Board of Library Trustees regular meeting for the Wilmette Public Library to order September 15, 2020 at 6.05 p.m. Can we have a roll call, please, Jan? Trustee Barsus? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barsus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Here. Trustee Johnson? Here. Here. Trustee Riddle? Here. Trustee Rogers? Not right now. Trustee Wolf? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Okay. And we also have present uh, three staff member, four staff members. Andrea, who's going to, uh, that leaves Children's Services, is going to do the presentation. Marty Belafonte, Gail Justman, and John Risco, and Elizabeth Seeger from the League of Women Voters. Okay, behind, at this time is time for public comment. Are there any attendees who would like to address the Wilmot Public Library Board of Trustees? Raise your hands if you would like to in the little chat thing. Okay, so there are no comments today. So the section number three, we have two sets of minutes to review. We have the August 13th, 2020 special meeting minutes where we reviewed the capital reserve study project can I have a motion to approve those minutes? A motion to approve those minutes. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Stuart Wilfa's motion to approve the minutes from the August 13th, 2020 special meeting. And Jan, ba Jan Barshis has uh, seconded. Is there any discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Can, yes, Joan, you got a question? Okay, it's been moved and second. Dan, do you want to do a roll call? Please? Sure. Thank you. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Sure. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Not present. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. You also have the minutes from our August 18th, 2020 regular board meeting. Behind section number three or in the attachment. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes from the uh, August 18th, 2020 board meeting? I'll motion to adopt those minutes. Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Okay. Okay. Uh, Trustee Wolf is motion to uh, motion to accept the minutes and Trustee Fishman has seconded. Is there any discussion regarding the minutes? Any corrections? Mm -mm. Okay. Being no corrections, can we have a roll call to adopt the minutes from the June, August 18th, 2020 board meeting? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barsis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Absent. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. At this time, I think I'll let you introduce our youth services manager, uh, Director Austin, and we look forward to hearing what's happening mm -hmm. and future plans. Okay, um, well, joining us this evening as our special guest pre presenter is Andrea Von Johnson, our head of youth services, and she's going to give us an overview of the summer reading club and talk a little bit about our programming for youth uh, this fall. Take it away, Andrea. Fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so it's good to see you all. Yes, I can. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all your support uh, in recent months. Um, it's going to talk a little about the summer reading program and then um, our plans for fall. Um, so we usually start planning our summer reading program around January. So in March, we realized quickly that we were gonna have to uh, pivot as they say. And uh, so we reinvented our summer reading program based on some 
you know, what we were hearing from parents about how they were zoomed out and they were overwhelmed with online activities at that time. And um, so we decided to make it as hands-on as we could. And so we um, created a mailer, some reading club mailer, which you're probably familiar with by now, with an activity poster that they could hang in the window um, or in their home. And we also sent them reading logs to every household in Wilmette, and uh, we had them report to a virtual booth in lieu of reporting to a booth on site since we didn't know when the building would be reopening when we planned it in March. Um, so um, we got great feedback about that, and thanks to the friends, we were able to offer some generous prizes for reporting their logs on our website. Um, we offered a $5 gift card to the Dairy Queen for 10 days of reading. And then when they reach 20 days of reading, they could receive a $15 gift card for the bookstall at Winneka. So we were also happy to be able to support some local businesses at the same time. Um, we got lots of um, fun um, emails uh, through the reporting form from kids talking about how they're reading and we were able to send a personalized response to every one of them. Um, you know, responding to what they were reading and making suggestions and the parents really enjoyed um, getting that kind of feedback. Um, you know what, I didn't open the stats, Anthony, but I'll do that while I'm talking. Um, we, um, yeah, we had, I think about 900 responses. So it was um, about half, um, over 500 reported for each, for 10 days and 500 for, about 500 and something for um, 20 days. And, um, oh, it's right here in my board report, sorry. 538 youth reported 10 days of reading and 498 youth came back to report 20 days, which is a really good kind of finishing rate because usually people will like start and then not finish, but they really finished strong. They really wanted that, that um, gift card from the bookstall. Um, so we we're thankful to the friends to be able to shift what we had been planning to spend this year into um, some generous gift cards and the kids were excited about that. Um, we also, that, I'm sorry, Andrea, just a quick question. Was that yeah. for the, the children, the $15 gift cards to the books? Yeah. So I'm, so I'm that, those were the numbers just for the children. I don't have mm -hmm. the numbers for adult services. Um, but the, um, we, um, through our, we decided to serve the teens in high school, um, mm -hmm. through the youth mm -hmm. program. We part, we partnered with Krista, the teen librarian to send out these Dairy Queen and bookstall gift cards to up to grade 12. And then the adult services department were only sending out um, the gift cards for the bookstall. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. And they, I remember Jill saying that she got some better numbers than she usually does. So I, I think <laughs> uh, we might have to keep up with this. I don't know how we're gonna keep doing it, but uh, we'll, we'll figure something out. Sure. Uh, and we had um, a virtual concert with Wendy and DB to celebrate the end of the summer. Um, so we, we, we kept it simple. We tried to replicate what, we, what the kids like to do in person as much as we could um, and to give them a free book, which is what, you know, is really the center of the, the program. Um, and uh, every um, person that sent in um, an online reporting form um, got a link to a parent survey in their response. Um, and so we sent out the parent survey um, starting June 1st. And um, we closed it out August 12th. And we had only 69 responses, um, but those, those were helpful in trying to design what we're gonna do next. So in August, um, we, were, we re reevaluated what we were doing. Cause in the spring, you know, we closed March 13th and within two weeks we were up and running, replicating our in-person schedule. The same number of programs we were doing, but um, virtual with recorded videos. Um, and we, um, replaced all the scheduled paid performers with Zoom programs. Some of the, for some of them, it was the first Zoom program they had ever performed. Um, and, um, you know, we looked at that, we looked at the numbers for that, and then we looked at our survey, and it looked like a um, majority of the parents were preferring Zoom as the platform for live programs. In the beginning, we had been hearing that parents want to watch a program at their own convenience, at, you know, whenever they like. So um, what we've done is we've um, consolidated a couple of the story times um, to do them once a week instead of twice a week and doing them live on Zoom so they can be interactive and we can see them and, and we can um, respond to them. But we're also trying to record them at the same time and then to share the videos online afterwards. So we're giving them the best of both worlds so that they want a live experience, they have that. 
and then we'll also have a recording. So if they can't make it at that time, you know, busy parents are very busy, then um, they can watch the recording through our website. And we're also um, updating all the website pages um, for youth to reflect all the new programming schedule and um, found a way to embed um, the videos which live on YouTube, but they can watch it right through our website. Um, so we're directing more traffic there as well. And it's more convenient, I think, than watching videos um, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're trying. We just started this week. We're doing a four week trial. Um, and some of the pro, I brought up the programs for you. Um, we're doing our core story time programs, baby time, rhyme time, um, and big kids story time for ages four to seven. Um, instead of preschool story, story time, we're doing a family story time and more open to all ages. Um, and we're continuing our STEAM lab programs where kids can um, do a, an experiment or a project with um, items from home. Um, we're making our Lego program a live and interactive program. It's called Lego Build Together. Um, we're restarting our book discussion, which will be live on Zoom. Um, Kids Library Council started in the summer and that's gonna continue live on Zoom. Um, we're doing an expressive writing program on Zoom for school age. And then we're gonna sprinkle in some, some more storytelling, um, special event story times, um, teaching artists and um, paid performers to come and do some school age um, interactive programs. Cause our survey respondees all, were also saying that their school age kids were looking for more arts um, to supplement the losses of um, extracurriculars and specials in the school. And um, they're just interested in arts and crafts and, um, and interacting with their peers. Yes. So we hope it works well. Um, we're gonna evaluate it, look at it and see how, the, you know, how many attendees we get, if we need to tweak the process. Um, we're learning as we go along. This whole year has been kind of uh, reinventing everything we do. Um, yes. Our survey also, um, we saw that majority of, of patrons prefer contactless pickup to get their materials. So we've also been talking about how we can make it easier for them to browse, for them to choose books, to pick up books. Um, in the beginning of the, the shutdown, we added a kids book picks form where they could get reader's advisory from a librarian through the form. Uh, they just tell us every, everything about what their kid likes to read and we would pick up books. Um, in August, we added an option um, for the librarian to just choose the books, put them on hold for pickup, you know, the most convenient option possible. And now overwhelmingly, almost every person chooses that option. So yes. they want, they don't even care what the books are. They just want us to, just, they want us to pick them out, put them on hold, done, you know. Um, so we're happy to do that. And we've been getting a lot of, a lot of those, um, a lot of those requests. And that's become a lot of our reference service lately. Um, when we're in the building is answering kids book picks as well as the in-person reference. Mm -hmm. If I could just comment on the uh, steam uh, bags that you have outside of the, yes. children's section of the library. That's wonderful. I've had, uh, you know, a couple of kids uh, try those and they're just fun, fun projects and not real difficult to do and a wonderful end to all of them, you know, for the kids to enjoy. So that was really, Creative, I thought. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we um, we're planning to continue doing those monthly and change them out every month. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> I will pass that on to the librarians who spearheaded that. Thanks. And those can be picked up with contactless pickup as well. Mm -hmm. They just give us a call and we arrange for them to do parking lot pickup for those. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, did I leave anything out? Do we and do we have any questions? Yeah, what's been your most successful program other than the summer reading program? What do you, what do kids gravitate to? I think the biggest attendance we had for a virtual program was the Magic Show uh, in July. Scott Scott Green. Um, I think we had almost fifty kids in the Zoom um, for that one. Hmm. He's a big name. Mm -hmm. What is some what are some things you're doing so that they don't have Zoom burnout? Because if they're seeing Zoom all day at school, and then yeah, those are the school age, not the preschool and the, the, the babies, but. It's a challenge, honestly. I'm, I'm not sure how popular they're gonna be. I think parents are asking for it, but if a reality, if their kids are really gonna wanna do it, we, we'll see. I think, um, 
What I'm thinking from, I mean, having my own child in remote school right now is that they don't really have opportunities to talk to each other about whatever they want. And so to give them free time to connect with each other, I think would be valuable for them. Um, mm. So there's the art and creativity piece and then the, making sure we build in peer to peer connection, you know? Hmm. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. You know, if we're ready to, to reinvent it again. Um, I feel like we're just relearning our jobs from scratch. Um, and, um, and we'll just keep trying to get feedback on what people need. Um, this is Trustee quite... Riddle. I had a, I... thank you so much for the update. And we were able to, I have three young kids too. We were able to take advantage of, of a lot of that. So I kind of echo your thoughts of um, the face-to-face -face and um, the ability, face-to-face -face time between students at school age, but also the ability to be active. Um, and I know a lot of our events are, you know, obviously reading, writing focused, arts focused, but I don't know if there's any thoughts on the ability to, you know, have some physical activity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's also maybe something on, you know, nutrition, maybe something on um, how, how our bodies work, you know, or how our hearts pump or something, you know, something like that, that mm -hmm. might get them focused on activity once again, or interested in activity or incentivated into activity again. So, yeah. Yeah. I, something, that was something we talked about a little bit when we were brainstorming in August, um, so I, did, I failed to mention, we, are, we did continue our story walks through the spring and mm -hmm. summer, which um, parents responded to strongly. And now we're going to change out the picture book every month. And I we're going to that. try to keep it up through the winter. Um, one of the ideas that was floated was kind of a physical fitness course, like you see in some parks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be a great partnership with, with parks. That's really more their like wheelhouse. Um, yeah, and for my Zoom performances, I was asking... Um, but those were mainly geared towards early childhood. I was asking them to try to get the kids moving um, in last spring. Um, so that's a good reminder to see how we can keep all the kids moving. We, we might be able to find some great movement teachers who could do something like that. Thank mm -hmm. you for the suggestion. Uh, this is Trustee Fishman. What about, I wonder if there could be anything like a, a cooking demonstration mm. on for would, kids? Do you think for kids that would appeal? You know, or yeah. snack, you know, something like that. How to make not necessarily ants on a log kind of thing, but something, you know, peanut butter and celery, but um, you know, something fun that maybe they could do. A lot I like Fina's idea of um, you know, nutrition and health and mm -hmm. um something along those lines. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's really great. Um, idea for school age kids that is a high, high appeal for that. Um, we have done programs um, where they have to pick up supplies, um, but I'm sure we could come up with some cooking program where it's affordable items that everybody has in their pantry. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be something like that. It, it's just that the cooking programs that for adults have been so well attended. Mm -hmm. And um, then of course there were tastings and things like that that were yeah. very popular. But I think the numbers on that, I, I attended almost all of them, um, were very high. The woman that he had was, was delightful, the chef, and um, it, it was very well received. So I mm. could see that. I think kids might get a kick out of that. Maybe they pick up a bag that has the ingredients, if, if that's even doable. Or, right, simple ingredients they may have at home, certainly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think either might be doable. What about treasure hunts? I love treasure hunts. Yes, I do too. <laughs> Are you familiar with the riddle walk that we put up in Mallinckrodt yes. Park? Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Uh -huh. um, that, was the, that was fun for everybody. Or treasure hunts. Got it. <laughs> we were we would like to do something like that in the on the library lawn, um, mm -hmm. yeah. hiding stuff, hiding stuff in the landscaping. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, please echo the, I mean, please uh, repeat the riddles. We really liked that. More riddles. Okay. The Mallinckrodt, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'll pass that on. And something that could hey, also... Oh, go ahead, Jen. 
No, after you, Stuart, go ahead. Oh, um, uh, um, I was thinking, you know, um, just remember what you're saying, um, if, you had, if you had teams of kids, and I don't know if it would be five kids or six kids, and you had some kind of a spelling competition, and to Fina's point, they'd have to actually use their bodies to, to, to make the letters. So I don't know if there's some, some way to, yeah, to do that to, yeah. Um, I should have had you all in my brainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm designing a game right now. So it's like, I, I'm thinking about gaming and all that. So yeah, so. I love it, I love it. Trustee Johnson. Thank you. Can you uh, just share, what's the, the head count of your either department or division, or you can educate me on the proper term, and, and about how many hours of, of programming are you putting out on a weekly basis? Let's see. Uh, we have six full-timers, and I believe four part-timers right now. Um, the hours of the part-timers vary between four hours a week and 20 hours a week. Um, of course, we're doing a lot more than, we talk a lot about programming, but it's a small part of what we do as far as, you know, our job maintaining the collection and doing reference work is probably takes up more hours than programming for sure. Um, let's see here. I'd have to total that up for you. Uh, and it just changed this week. But, um, but this week we're doing four story times a week and then we're doing one, two, three, four, five, six new monthly programs. Um, so however that adds out, adds up. Um, also for Zoom programs, you need double the staff um, because you need a co-host. And then sometimes we have tech support from computer services, which is very helpful. If there's like an issue with Zoom or issue with somebody's computer, they help remotely with that. Um, and of course there's prep time. So you might prep like two to three hours for each program that you do as far, you know, the planning and, you know, collecting the materials and rehearsing. Uh, and then afterwards uploading the videos um, takes some time. You've got to download them from Zoom and then to your computer and then upload them to YouTube and then we connect them. So there's a kind of like, um, sometimes you have to edit the video afterwards. So um, it's, it's several hours per program, I would say. Um, not just looking at the time actually performing it, you know? Um, so it's hard to say. Okay, I mean, it's about um, 10 sound right, based on what you said, or is that low? Uh, you know what, I, I'd have to get back to you about that. I'd have to do a little math. Okay, uh, and then could you talk a little bit about, um, I mean, uh, my kids are in District 39, we've got a, um, Wilmette Library app on our iPads now, which is nice to see more, uh, you know, formal relationships uh, between uh, the school districts. Can can you talk a little bit about sort of the, what sort of formal partnerships uh, we've got with Avoca or District 39 or Nutrier? Sure, sure. Um, well, currently. Excuse me, Andrea, um, Dan, can you mute your, can, uh, excuse me, Dan, Dan, can you mute your microphone? Because I'm hearing a lot of feedback from your, I think it's from your phone. I, I am muted, but I'll continue oh, to remain muted. It's not okay. showing muted. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so we, we've been uh, a new partnership with D39 is we are um, uh, making our eBooks more readily available to students um, and they are um, getting a product called Sora through Overdrive which means that they can, um, students can have access to um, all the library eBooks using um, their student ID or lunch number. It's gonna make eBooks for students through in class and at home a lot more accessible. Um, and the um, schools, D39 is also gonna be purchasing um, a lar larger collection of eBooks through that platform um, for curriculum needs. Um, so that's something pretty exciting. Um, we're going to be visiting um, classrooms virtually to talk up the new ebook product once it's launched. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already had some fourth grade teachers at Harper that are chomping at the bit for us to come in and visit their classes. So that's going to be fun. Um, and um, we're also, um, I've got two workshops scheduled in October to talk about ebooks and e resources for homework help. So, like support for remote learning. Um, for parents and you know kids are welcome to attend as well. So we're going to do a workshop for K to four and a workshop for um, grades five to eight. 
Um, that's what we've been talking about with the schools um, most recently. Um, I've been in touch, we've been in touch with our contacts there to find out you know, what they need and what's going on. Um, and um, I'm introducing more um, drawing programs and um, arts because we've heard that the specials are um, not as much of a focus. They're focusing on the core subjects in the schools. Um, so kind of keeping an eye on what's going on with, with their new plan helps us you know, inform what, what our programs are gonna be. Um, so that's, that's what's been going on this month. And then final on that, um, maybe, uh, does youth typically thought of to include high school or does youth sort of end at eighth grade? Um, so we usually end at eighth grade and then adult services serves, serves grades nine to 12 with their um, teen librarian. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks for the fine job that youth services. We all wish we could be kids again, those that don't yeah. have kids to take advantage of some of the programs. Thank Absolutely. you so much. I'd stick around, but I've got to get home to my kiddos. Okay, but thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye -bye. And if you've got any other suggestions, you can email Andrea. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. We're moving to the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers is not here, so we're going to go over the financial reports for August 2020. And if you look at the, uh, with the revenue report, 1.156 million, 420 were, was received in real estate taxes, $17,929.15 in the general fund interest and 5,804 $5,804.19 in replacement taxes. Given that the deadline is coming up for taxes before uh, October 1st, before interest is charged, we expect to receive some quite a bit more in the month of September. Uh, expenditure report, total ex general fund expenses at 17.9% are expected, are the expected two month rate of 16.66%. Seven accounts show expenses higher than the two month rate, but at this point in the fiscal year, these overages are all due to the timing of expenses. You've got the check detail that shows the wellness insurance. Insurance is always one of our largest ones, aside from materials uh, and the reading. And you also have Chase card services for $5,219 and the Cooperative Computer Services for $22,275.19. Uh, the total amount of uh, this report represents expenses paid by check and does not include expenses paid by electronic transfer of funds, such as the biweekly payroll on 8 14 for $116,510.35 and the 828 payroll for $111,495.58. You see the certificate of deposits and we were lucky we got it because the rates have dropped pretty low for some of the ones that are being renewed to less than 0.06%. You also have the statement of liabilities and fund balance. And so are there any questions. And trustee, I mean, Director Austin will be answering those. Fina, I mean, Trustee Riddle. Hi, thanks. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I think what you meant to say was that the general expenses were above the expected two-month rate um, in August. And I wanted to know, it says because of timing, does this mean that these costs are typically incurred in August? I think yes, that's correct. So a lot of these expenses would be for like database renewals. Um, so it's a one-time expense that we have within the fiscal year. Um, and that's, that's why we would typically be over on some of those magazine subscriptions, things like that. Things that are a one-time cost, but that would be for an entire year's worth of service, typically would be paid out at the beginning of the fiscal year. So this is, this is a fairly consistent, um, we're, we're normally a little bit over on this one than, than we would be typically going forward. During this time, thank you. 
I wanted to also ask um, about Baker and Taylor. I wasn't familiar with that name. The other ones I was, the wellness insurance I'd seen. Yeah, Baker and Taylor is um, one of the big jobbers. Um, they're a, a, a book vendor. So um, they provide us um, all of our books. They're, they're Thank you. our primary source of, of print material for the library. Thank you. That's when you reference the book, the book costs. Uh-huh. And then um, we are kind of in a, this was also, uh, it happened to our, our family as well, but um, we had this, when I was reading about the certificate of deposit activity, August seemed to be where um, there's been some maturities. And so I wanted to ask how um, this approach that we take to transfer um, the investments, are we, um, obviously with it says North Shore Community Bank, and then is it, is it Ron? And that meets with North Shore and with how do we change our approach and how do we how does this approach um, well we're this who's involved we're legislated in terms of how we can invest our funds and sure and I, I yes trustee uh, I Risco and Anthony you all do you want to talk a little bit about the process of redoing oh no so good that helps me so it's miss it's John and Anthony. And yeah. Anthony. Okay. Right. And, and so I'm, I'm shop around the banks and sometimes the banks shop around us. But right now, all the ones I've looked at are like 0.6% in the last two months. 0.06% some of them. Thank uh, you. John, I see that you've unmuted. Do you want to make a comment there about the uh, CD activity? Yes. Uh, just um, to it's 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 a tough situation now with the um the chaotic situation of the markets um cd two or cds are just it's it's 0.1 percent it's just not worth putting it into and and locking it in for an extended period of time so north shore community bank has a product called the max safe account and what that does is it pays a higher rate and it looks at the illinois funds rate which right now most municipalities are going into but that has gone from like two and a half percent for the beginning of the year. I looked at it earlier today, it's at 0.13. So there's really not many products out there we can put this in. So that's why I'm going with Max Safe because it's the best we can do right now. It's short term and if something happens, we, you know, if something goes up and there's a product, we can put it into that product. That makes sense. Thank you for the explanation. Any more questions? And this is a good time to ask questions if you have any before we approve the bills and salaries for August 2020. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I have a, a suggestion perhaps that's also a question as we're about to vote on this uh, motion approving payment of the library's bills and salaries. And this is something I plan personally to support. Um, it would perhaps be helpful to know if there's a, any trustee is voting no on that particular issue. It would be helpful to know what the reasoning is so that we can better understand the vote. So if anyone's going to vote no, I would appreciate an explanation. I'll take that invitation, Jan. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, this is Trustee Johnson. Um, yeah, my thinking is um, I've been looking for some more shared services and shared resources with our sister agencies that we've had to date. And, you know, looking at hiring our own building manager with all, pardon my uh, young colleague in the background, but it's what happened to the six o'clock hour. But um, you know, hiring our building manager to me is an indication that I think we need uh, uh, a better look at our operating budget. So uh, I intend to uh, continue, I intend to vote no tonight as well on our, uh, essentially the way that trustees can express their ongoing opinion on our operating budget. 
but it's not any particular vendor that happened to pop up in August. So we appreciate you sharing that and we hope that you would do so in the future. And I think trust, uh, Director Austin is looking at a building services man based on that capital reserves report. There's going to be an awful lot of work coming forward. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. 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 Okay, is there a motion to adopt the bill and salaries for August 18th? A motion uh, to approve the bills and salaries for August. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. So it's a sort of a tie between you. So Go ahead. Trustee, we'll split Give between you two the next time. Trustee Wolf has moved to approve the bills and salaries for August, and Trustee Varshish has seconded it. Is there any other discussion? Okay. Being none, can we take a roll call? Sure. Thank you. Trustee Barshes? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Absent. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. We're now moving to our two action items. The first, uh, is the suspension of the patron and this will be the second time that he has been suspended based on our policy uh director austin has sent a note suspending him and then what we need to do is affirm that and so i based on out of concern for both our employees our patrons and their overall environment i would move that we suspend Uh, George Seabury indefinitely. Uh, is there a motion for the suspension? I will motion to suspend for suspension. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Stuart Wolf has moved to a s suspend George Seabury indefinitely and trust. The Varshis has seconded it. Is there any discussion? And as a footnote, both em uh, employees are back working. And so oh, cool. mm -hmm. back at, at there. Trustee uh, Riddle? Yes, thanks. Um, I think uh, Director Austin provided an excellent um, background of the incident and um, informed us all promptly. Um, I also read about it in in next uh, in next door. So I think the um, the Wilmette police also was able to, you know, summarize the incident well. Um, so I think this is um, certainly a good measure that's being taken. It's in order to in order to you know protect, of course, our staff and and our patrons. So thank you for putting that together, um, Anthony. I wanted to ask that you mentioned that there was a second, in, this was the second incident. Did we, is this the same individual who was suspended in fall of 2019? No. This was the one that was suspended because there were two people that got in an argument in the computer room and uh, he took offense because uh, Elder, a senior, a more mature gentleman, since I'm a more mature, uh, basically uh, told them about his sagging pants, and so there became a verbal discussion. No problem. Okay. Okay. I just wasn't sure if this was the the that was the same individual. No, okay. It's a different one. Different. Any other questions? Thank you. No questions, but I would like to uh, uh, thank the Wilmet course for responding the way they did and taking care of things, actually finding this person and uh, taking him to a better place, at least at this point. Um, just one quick comment. Um, I, uh, I'm glad you sort of uh, helped clarify that it was from that incident in the computer room. And um, I just wonder whether we might think about, given that we have a fuller picture of the gentleman who's 
under discussion today, whether uh, we might want to think about looking back on whether the decision that I supported at the time to also uh, temporarily suspend the other gentleman uh, for, I think it was three months or six months, whether we might want to uh, reconsider um, our position at the time and if there's something we may want to think about with that gentleman, given that we've got a fuller picture of the, the gentleman at issue. Um, well, that's all I wanted to put out there for consideration. Thank you. But he's been off, the gentleman's been off suspension, but he's, they don't think he's been back. He's not been back to the library, has he? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's why I bring it up. I just kind of, I just kind of feel bad about it. You know, I, okay. I certainly voted for it at the time, but I, I just kind of feel bad about it. So I just wanted to raise it here. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? It's been moved and second. Can we have a roll call? Mm-hmm. Trustee Barshes? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Absent. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. We're moving now to talk about the purchase of the vehicle, and I'm going to turn it over to Director Austin. Okay. Thank you all. Um, well, as I mentioned in my lengthy email to you all on Friday, we've been um, working with a local car dealership in an effort to bring forward an actual quote to you all uh, regarding the purchase of the library vehicle that we've been discussing now for, gosh, almost about a year. Um, when we uh, initially were discussing the retirement of the endowment fund, um, we were talking about allocating those funds for um, a purpose that fulfilled the original purpose of the endowment fund. And we talked about a number of ways that we might be able to address that. And we discussed the vehicle for a, a fair bit of time and we continued that discussion into our budget process this past spring and uh, there was provisional approval for that vehicle at that time and um, here we are this fall and we find ourselves um, in a time when this vehicle is actually on sale and is being offered to us at invoice which is a wonderful coincidence. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will say that that's not the uh, the reason why we settled on this vehicle. Um, we, we were certainly looking at pricing all along but uh, uh, staff weighed a number of options and trying to identify what the needs were that we had and which vehicles were going to help us to meet that need and we ultimately were taking into consideration um, what the staff's purpose was as well as the board's wish to find a vehicle that was going to support our green initiatives and I was very happy when we decided upon uh, this particular vehicle that we're looking at the 2020 Chrysler Pacifica because it was the only minivan that was available that also had the option of being a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And as we analyzed the costs um, of the vehicle, we determined that the hybrid um, would be able to meet our, our needs on a day-to-day -day basis and may actually never really even need to run on fuel. Um, because that battery can be charged um, uh, fully in two hours, we could do our morning run, come back to the library, plug it back in, and go out and do our afternoon run and uh, not have to use uh, a single gallon of fuel. Uh, which is really exciting. So when we started crunching the numbers on that, we found that um, the difference in price between the, uh, the gas vehicle and the electric vehicle um, was about $5,000. And um, we, uh, here's Dr. Rogers, I'm, I'm letting him into the meeting. Um, we, uh, it's 648. Um, we, uh, we determined that um, the, uh, the hybrid vehicle was actually um, going to be a really good option for us after we ran the numbers. We thought the break even on that $5,000 difference would probably happen sometime around the year three or so, depending on how many miles we end up driving the vehicle. And since we figured that we're going to have this vehicle in our fleet for probably about 10 years, um, and that is the warranty period on the uh, on the battery itself too on the vehicle, uh, that we feel that this is that this is a, a reasonable investment. Um, I will also add that in our consideration as we were looking at vehicles, I did look at um, Go Green's website. They've got a page that they've dedicated to um, uh, vehicles. And uh, there were a number of resources there that the staff and I found valuable as we were doing research. And uh, we felt that the consideration of the hybrid vehicle um, helps us to be good stewards to, to our community. And uh, I think it really reflects the character of our community if the library vehicle is in fact an electric one. So. Um, I appreciate your support of that, and um, if you've got any questions for me about the proposal that we have before you here, um, I'd be happy to, to take any questions that you may have. Uh, Fina. 
Thanks, Anthony. Um, I was you mentioned the um, the hybrid versus non hybrid um, benefits um, and charging is certainly um, uh, you know battery versus gas use is certainly um, I think a good thing. I wanted to ask um, about the price difference. So for a non hybrid was um, five thousand dollars less than a hybrid of at the invoice or sticker cost. Is that correct? All right. So as a point of clarification, um, right now the um, the uh, the Pacifica hybrid is on sale. It is the only vehicle that is currently being offered at invoice price um, by Chrysler. There's a promotion right now because the 2021 model is coming out in October and all the dealerships are trying to clear their lots of the 2020 models and therefore they're offering them at invoice pricing through the month of September. So not only is this, um, this vehicle is actually maybe even cheaper at the moment than the gas vehicle. I mean, my initial price quotes were for the, the MSRP on these vehicles. Um, obviously the, the, the pricing that's gonna be extended to us will be a little bit different than that. Um, right now the hybrid might actually be cheaper than the gas one. I see, okay. Thank you for that clarification. And, and then, you mentioned there is an extra cost though to um, add the charging. Is that at, at the car or at the um, library location? That would be um, a, a cost that we would incur at the library. So it would be um, an additional fixture that we would install on the outside of the building. And then it would be, it would be mounted on the building and uh, then we'd have some electrical work to, to get it tied into the system. Um, and we estimate that that would cost about a thousand dollars to put that in. Okay, thank you. I thought it was also in the, on the car. Okay, and would we, you know, would we be using the library? Would the library only allow that charging station specifically for this hybrid vehicle? Correct. Great. Um. The break-even term, I think that's the accounting term for the depreciation cost versus the effective cost. It's where you, where it meets is you said around three or four years. Is that correct? So um, that's based on the MSRP for the gas vehicle versus the hybrid vehicle. Um, because of the $5,000 difference, we were estimating what $5,000 worth of gas would be. Um, with the mileage that we would be driving it, um, assuming that we, we would be running electric only for those 5,000 miles, or the, the, those $5,000 versus the gas dollars, is, I'm, I'm rambling. Um, it's, that's kind of, that's what the formula is, that's what I'm referring to as the break even. Um, but right now, I, I think that probably is, I'm gonna say is probably irrelevant because the cost is probably cheaper for the hybrid vehicle at the moment. When we did the research in late August, we weren't aware of the sale. I see. So the break even there is me, it's mainly our, like where we would break it, where the library would break even in the cost of the car, not, not so much in the depreciation versus, okay. Right. So if, if you were to tell me, oh, gee, we don't want the electric $5,000, that seems exorbitant to me. That's kind of a luxury. We don't need to do that. Um, I'm saying that, you know, well, actually we would probably break even at, at year three or four. So it probably, you know, it, that would be something to consider. Got it. In yeah, favor that's of the a, a nice point to make. Thanks. Um, and I wanted to know also about the amount of mile mileage that you typically go. We're going like the Wilmette area, Glenview, you know, kind of Skokie, Evanston, Kenilworth kind of all but up. But how many miles typically do you do? You, um, is the route. Right, so this is going to change. Um, right now, when the, when the library book drops are open, it's a seven mile loop that we run. Um, so when I quoted that seven mile figure in that email, that's what I was referring to, that's the book drop collection. Now, in the afternoons, we do have staff that go out and make um, individual deliveries to preschools, uh, to senior centers, visits to the public schools, to park district facilities, our partners. Um, we also use our vehicles to go, our own personal vehicles to go to continuing education, um, conferences, trainings, participation in our uh, consortial meetings through CCS, ALA, PLA, RAILS, et cetera. 
um, this vehicle could be used for those purposes as well um, and would limit the, the library's liability um, for the for um, uh, damage to one of our, our uh, employees vehicle yeah personal vehicles um, so I think that the and obviously the other piece that we're talking about here is is also an expansion of the service that we're offering for homebound services um, as we're in the middle of a pandemic and a number of our patrons are still not comfortable coming inside the building um, this, there's another way that we could expand our services and actually deliver resources directly to people's homes. Um, since we're already out doing runs, we're looking at logistics to figure out, you know, if, if this is a feasible option for us, and we really feel that it is. It's not camera ready to share that information right now, but it's in development. And if we had that vehicle, that would definitely be another way that we could deploy it uh, to the greater use of the community. Thanks, Anthony. And and that's another reason why we like the flexibility of this specific vehicle is that it can function both as a cargo vehicle and a passenger vehicle and can pretty seamlessly uh, transition from one to the other. Um, this is Trustee Fishman. I have a question. You talked in the past about wrapping the vehicle. Have you, um, that's still an, under consideration? Yes. Great. I think that's important. And mm -hmm. I just want to commend Trustee Barshas, who was a um, supporter of a hybrid vehicle. And um, I, I really applaud her that she uh, put forth that um, information and, and her passion and her partnership with Go Green Will Met. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Any other questions? I'd love to get an update, if you don't mind, um, Anthony, when you said that the, that the cost might actually be lower. It's just nice if you don't mind, even, um, you know, privately, not, not in the next meeting or anything, but I'd love to get an update on that, um, the prices that you might be getting. So what I'm, what I'm hoping we can come to tonight, just as a point of clarification, is that I would get your provisional approval of uh, a not to exceed price for this vehicle so that I can then go forward and negotiate while this sale is still going on in September um, so that we can go ahead and get this vehicle purchased and get it um, in operation. So you know, what as soon as I know what that price what figure would that be? It, what figure would we, I'm sorry? What, what figure would the motion have to be at? Which, what, what figure should we put the, mo uh, the motion at? Not to exceed? I, I think, you know, if, I'm sorry, Stuart, go ahead. Just saying, what, what, should the, what should the figure be at that we give you for not to exceed? What, what dollar amount? I think a not to exceed of 50 is reasonable. Um, I, I've been talking with, um, with a couple dealerships about this, and I think that we'll be able to get the vehicle for under 50 for sure. Um, MSRP, as I said in my email, was 51 for the vehicle that we were looking at and discussing, and they quoted me about 10,000 less than that. So I think that would give us enough wiggle room. Uh, we need to also figure in the uh, documentation, title, transfer, you know, that sort of detail that, that's also associated costs. We are tax exempt, so we don't need to worry about that detail. Um, but I, I think that a not to exceed 50 is reasonable and, and we can certainly meet that. Well, I'm, I'm comfortable motioning that we, uh, we give you that ability to uh, provisionally to go not to exceed $50,000 in negotiating for a hybrid vehicle because as we've already discussed, it seems like after year two or year three, it's going to start to be a net positive to us um, by going hybrid versus not. So that's great. So thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> I beat you to it every time. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> Trustee Wolf has moved to purchase the Pacifica hybrid at a cost not to exceed 50,000. Trustee Barshis has seconded. Is there any additional discussion? Yeah, I do. I think that if we expect it to go a bit lower, why don't we just, I think that maybe we could, is 10,000 more than we might need for wiggle room? Like if you said that it's about 41, you know, would an additional five cover that, Anthony, or, you know, trustees? I it's think the way that Anthony mentioned that there's titles, there's title and other related expenses that might that are on top of the actual cost of the vehicle. That could add up to 10,000 more. So that could add up to 50. Just, we'll just say give him the wiggle room. It's not that he's going to try to hit the ceiling. He'll still try to hit the floor. Yeah. You know, yeah. 
Yeah, of course. No, of course. I get it. But I just wasn't sure would an additional five or a six be. We lost you. Any other discussion? So is that a no? It wouldn't be sufficient? We don't know. We, we, don't, we know he's not going to spend probably 50, but he has wiggle room if it's 48. By the time he puts the charging station and all of that. So I know when we do building, we generally give some wiggle room and it always comes right back. So it's just to give him, since it's September and new models come out in October and we're not going to meet again. And he could play games with it, you know, because he had, can spend up to 5000 until that policy changes. But why? Since it's coming mm -hmm. out of and it might cost us in the long run if we end up giving him not enough wiggle room, we lose the deal, and then it, yes, then it, then the price escalates in October. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I'm not trying to delay the the purchase. Right. I just wasn't sure. Like like Lisa mentioned, I think we have the ability of five, um, of not approving an expense of five or lower. So anyway, all right. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to to be sure that. You know, maybe if it's an additional, if we expect, you know, an additional three or four thousand, why not just keep it closer to that amount? But there's really no advantage in doing that because the amount spent is going to be reflected in what the actual costs are. And so if it can be done for less, then that's what we'll pay. Um, but for purposes of negotiating the agreement. There are some expenses, by the way, in the purchase of a vehicle, even by a tax exempt organization that we're not exempt from. Registration fees and other things related to that. There are some additional expenses when you purchase a car that uh, other than taxes that we're liable for. So the issue of how much below isn't really an advantage because Providing a, the limit of 50 does not mean that we are intending to spend 50. No, I and I completely get that. I'm just these are public funds. It's I'm not I am not arguing. Um, I just wasn't sure if we wanted to keep it closer to what we may more accurately be estimating. Well, what will show up in the invoices are what the actual costs are. The, the amount that we approved does not represent. I think expenditure. I get it, but the estimation is what I was talking about. Thank you, though. If if you if you prefer to move on, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, kind of make this an out long long discussion. Okay. It's been moved and seconded, and there's been a discussion. It was moved to purchase the Pacifica Hybrid for a price not to exceed 50,000, including transfer fees and all the other fees associated with it. Trustee Wolf moved it. Trustee Barsh seconded. Can we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barsh, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. Okay. Moving along. Thank and you. I really, people, really appreciate that. Yep. You're going to have to work your magic now. Okay. You bet. I will. Uh, I will. Um, <laughs> I will be a shrewd negotiator as best as I can be, and okay. uh, I will let you know as soon as we've got some good news to share with you all. Okay. Thank you so much for your support. And he. And Jan, get, and Jan gets to recharge the vehicle the first time. <laughs> I'll take that seriously. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll motion that. I'll motion that. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on to the capital reserve study update, Director Austin. Okay. All right. So I wanted to give you a quick update here. I don't have a lot of news to share, but I wanted to let you know that I have been in meetings with um, with Joe Huberty and with uh, John Shales, president of uh, Shales McNutt, um, who was our construction manager on the outdoor renovation project, and. Um, spoke with both of them um, in follow-up from our meetings in August and talked about the uh, the discussions that we had had about wanting to uh, to put together a project that addresses our most immediate needs 
and to try to get something like that moving here pretty quickly. Um, Joe's group agreed that they would help us out with the engineering drawings, and uh, John agreed that he is available with his crew to be able to put together some bid uh, related information for us, and they would be willing to serve as our construction management on a project uh, going forward as well. Um, so the idea, the idea here would be for us to be able to um, to uh, bring hopefully uh, a bid project um, forward here uh, this fall. Um, uh, the timeline is kind of aggressive for us, but um, what we're going to shoot for is to try to have something um, that would be posted likely in November and that we could bring before you all in December uh, that you could then vote upon and then we could move forward with our contractors, have them engaged um, early in January so that we, we would be able to start a project like this potentially in the winter. Um, and that's when we know that we would probably would best be equipped to do a, a project like this that may actually require the building to be closed as we were discussing previously. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be bound by the time. We would just, we would just know um, who the players would be and uh, when that project would be eligible to start. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's still a, a, obviously a bit more work that we need to do before I can share much more detail with you, but I wanted to let you know that we are in motion and uh, that we're taking this seriously and that we're going to try to get this thing rolling here really quickly this fall. Um, any, any questions or comments about um, that activity? Uh, just, this is Trusty Barshes. Just um, thank you for putting all the work into this that you are doing. It's a, a lot to shoulder when you have everything else going, but the uh, people who will be working with you to do these projects uh, are excellent and they will do a great job. I have full confidence in you and, and in them, so. Thank you. Um, and Shales also told me that we could get Jason back again. Uh, Jason was our oh. project manager on the outdoor renovation project and so we he would love to great. be able to work with him again. Yes, wonderful. All right, any, any other questions or comments about uh, the Capital Reserve project? I guess to follow up on that, um, uh, I think it's great that we're getting a, a professional process to estimate and implement our capital funds. Um, I thought I heard President McDonald suggest that our new, I don't know if it's hired or in the process, but our building facilities manager would be sort of playing a role in that. Could you talk a little bit about your sort of you know, perspective on whether these professionals that you're working with, if they're going to sort of be quarterback or if you're going to be the main staffer or if our new buildings person, you know, can you just explain to me whether what the role is of uh, staff versus these, um, you know, good consultants you're bringing on in terms of, you know, implementing all these projects? Um, I think the staff's role, um, whether it's myself or the manager, is to um, oversee operations um, at, of the library and to ensure that we're cooperating with the construction manager and his firm. Uh, the construction manager, Shales McNutt, would be coordinating all the trades and directing the daily work of, of all those skilled trades when they're in the building. Um, they would be responsible for all of those tasks. Um, obviously, the role that we're looking at with our new facilities and security manager uh, that job description is is much more enhanced than what we had previously in that job description. So the expectation there is that that manager um, would be coming before you here to give updates about what the status of projects um, that are going on in the building would be. Uh, that wouldn't just be my responsibility, but obviously I'm still that figurehead and I would serve in that capacity and help to direct those activities and provide reports to you all. Um, but I am expecting this facilities manager to be more active and engaged. Uh, that said, um, it is still the cons I, I think the construction manager model is still the appropriate approach for us to take. I think we got great results by doing it that way with shales um, for a very limited cost. Um, they really took a lot of the work off of the library. Um, I, th I think that was a reasonable investment. So, um, mm. it, it, yeah, thank you. I, I, you know, I do too. I just uh, wanted to clarify that it sounds like uh, all that work would be managed by the professional bringing in and not this new position that we're hiring, which be more of the internal operation stuff that we're uh, managing to do with current staff. But I, that was just yeah. my point of clarification. So thank you. Plus you've also added yeah. security to that position, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He will also, the person, he or she will be responsible for the security too. 
a, a little restructuring, yes. The initial tasks in this project are first to locate the sources of the problem. And that's really an engineering task. Um, your new facilities manager will not be likely to have much to contribute, you know, coming into a new building and attempting to new for him and, or her. And um, uh, the, the real issue is going to be for the engineering work to identify where the water is coming from um, and what to do about it. If it's something on the na nature of hydraulic pressure from underneath the floor, um, that's very challenging engineering work to come up with solutions. Uh, if it's coming through um, something like the uh, foundation on the perimeter, uh, that's a different set of, of requirements. So the first steps really are not tasks that in-house staff would be likely to be able to do uh, because they really require specialized skills and assessment of uh, where the water is traveling from. Um, and we don't yet know, we don't have enough information. The past study that we had done wasn't designed to attempt to get to that level of detail. So that's really the work that would start uh, in the early stages is to try to determine where the water is coming from. That's a tough task. Uh, anyone who's had basement uh, issues with seepage or flooding would know just how difficult that can be. And that's really what we're talking about here. So, you know, this is not a project that's going to be um, a matter of staff just trying to figure out what can be done easily, um, this, these are problems that can be very complex. Now, if we get really lucky, it won't be so complex, but we don't know that yet. We don't have the information to be able to come to any conclusion about that. And I've dealt with a lot of water seepage issues, you know, with my home because of problems that exist that we've, you know, we've spent 40 years working on those problems and we have them under control at this point, but we didn't get them controlled in one step uh, or even in the first few years that we were here. It took a long time and a lot of steps to go through to get all of that resolved. I don't know whether that's what we're going to find with um, these seepage problems, but those are tough problems to solve in many cases. So we're just gonna have to be patient to see what the engineers find and what they can tell us about what possible solutions would be. Thanks, Trustee Rogers. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? You wanna to go to serving our public 4.0. We got a great start with Andrea talking about kids programming. So Anthony? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, thank you. Um, so this is part of our um, our monthly process of reviewing the chapters and serving our public, and uh, this one's on programming. I did go through all of the standards, and I reviewed the checklist um, that was provided to you all in the packet, and I'm happy to say that Wilmette Library, again, continues to exceed the standards. Um, in fact, uh, one of the items there almost reads exactly like our mission statement. The library presents educational, cultural, and recreational programs that reflect the community needs and interests. That's like almost verbatim what our mission statement is. The next item below that, programming is designed to address the diversity within the community to increase awareness of the library resources and services to attract new users. Um, that's almost a direct line out of our strategic plan. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these activities are um, in this checklist are part of our day-to-day -day activities and uh, part of the job descriptions of our staff. So we've already incorporated a lot of this into what we're doing. And as Andrea was saying earlier, um, we're trying to find ways that we can pivot and still have meaningful programs for people, even though we are, are not able to allow folks to gather in the library building and during a pandemic. Um, we know that not everyone adapts to the digital environment. And I think that is one of the challenges that we've got. Um, our programming partners with the park district um, may be able to help us because they, they 
have space. And while the weather is still pleasant, we're able to do that. Um, we're able to use a little bit more space outside the library. Um, the lawn, unfortunately, is probably not large enough for us to host a substantial program. As you can see in Stuart's background there, um, that's a really great background, by the way, Stuart. Um, Stuart is the reading boy today. You're like right in front of the statue. Yeah, I know. I, I can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, we're, um, the lawn space that we've got there, and as you know from our, our big lawn celebration that we had last fall for the finishing of the renovation, um, we can gather a lot of folks there, but when you start putting a six foot circle um, around each of those spots on the lawn, it really limits just how many people we can gather out there. And we took some preliminary measurements and just determined that wouldn't be an appropriate place for us to try to gather families in a pande pandemic. Um, so the virtual programming is still something that we're, we're all kind of adapting to right now. Um, and that is a bit of a sticking point for us, but we're doing what we can to, to adapt to that and to try to make it alluring for our, our, our public to attend those programs. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more about that here in the moment in the director's report, but um, I think that's probably one of the, if there were any aspects of, the, of this programming checklist that are a challenge for us right now, I would say that's probably the biggest one. Um, Wilmet really has historically exceeded um, all of these guidelines and we have exceptional programming here and well attended. Our, our patrons are very much engaged, whether it's the range of, of armchair uh, travel programs that we've got from, provided through the Rutherford Trust, or if it's the concert series that we're doing on the um, Friday nights and weekends, um, I know that those are programs that our patrons miss because we're still getting really strong participation from those even in a digital environment. But um, it's just not the same attending a concert uh, via Zoom than it is you know, doing it in person inside mm -hmm. the library. Uh, so hopefully this time next year, things will be different. Um, we're doing what we can right now given the environment. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have about um, the checklist if you want me to speak to any of those details. But as I said before, I think, I think we're right on target where we need to be. I do have one comment. Um, I would like to congratulate you and the library on having programs with people of different colors. Um, given the climate that exists out there now, I think that's very important. And to bring people in to talk, explain, play music, whatever, is a real good idea right now. So thanks for what you do for that. Thank you. How about a review of the update of the pandemic response and reopening plan? <clears throat> sure. So, um, you know, uh, um, I would say that right now, I think one of our biggest challenges is um, the fact that folks are, are getting a, a little bit more I think burnt out on the notion that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, generally, folks who are inside the library are following our guidelines. Um, we did introduce some new guidelines based upon CDC recommendations in August. Um, so beginning um, in late August, early September, we introduced a, a clarification of our mask requirement. Um, you can see the sign post at the, posted at the front door. The CDC um, is saying that masks that have valves and vents on them um, uh, allow uh, uh, the, the wearer to expire respiratory droplets. If that person in fact has COVID, uh, they can spread the virus even though they're wearing a mask. So um, the CDC is recommending that folks not wear uh, those masks that have the, uh, the vents on them. Uh, we've got a sign that has pictures of the masks that we deem acceptable and those that are not, and those are the ones with those little vents on them. Uh, so that's a new thing. Um, and to help folks who are compliant by wearing masks, but have the ones with the vents, um, we are offering uh, free masks to those folks to wear when they're in the library to ensure that they're um, providing adequate coverage to themselves and others while they're here. Um, so that is one enhancement that we did put forth. Um, we have not made any resistance whatsoever on that implementation. We have handed out a couple masks to folks uh, since we did that, um, but we really uh, seriously have not had any issues related to masks here at the library. Uh, that's been great. Um, capacity limits, we, we are in fact getting close to with capacity. Um, we're seeing our door counts are going up. They're certainly not what they were last year, um, but um, our door counts are in fact going up and we, we very nearly reached our capacity this past weekend. Um, we are limiting capacity of the building to 50 patrons at a time. And we got up into the high 40s over the weekend. And um, 
uh, particularly in the youth services department, uh, we're finding that um, uh, some families were congregating up there and they were using the library as they would have, you know, maybe eight months ago. And uh, this just isn't the right space to come to, to to plop down on the floor and have a story time right now. It's it's a great place to come and get resources and to get help from a librarian, um, but not a place to camp out. So we're we're trying to encourage folks to limit their visiting time to about an hour, and uh, and then to make their selections and move on so that other folks can enter the library. To date, we have not um, we have not reached the capacity of 50 where we're limiting people um, and and having them line up outside. Um, however, we do have an internal procedure that if the youth services department um, reaches a capacity of 25 people, uh, that we may have to hold a family at the front door um, and wait for a family to leave before we'll let, let another group come in. Um, and again, that's just because we want to keep that, the capacity of that space appropriate to the number of people there. It is a smaller space and um, because it's on the second floor, people have to pass one another in the staircase. Uh, we're limiting how many people can be in the elevator at a given time too. So. You know, we, like I said, we haven't had to do that limit yet, but we've gotten very nearly close to it. So I just want you to be aware of that. Um, I think with the, with, the, uh, um, with the introduction of the vehicle, we can start revisiting the topic of reopening the remote book drops. That was one of the topics that we had discussed as a, a new service enhancement. Uh, so that would be a new step that we could take. Um, as soon as we've got a new facilities and security, and, facility and security manager in place, as well as a circulation manager. Those are two very critical roles that became vacant in the middle of the pandemic. Um, as soon as those are filled, and we expect that to be in October, um, hopefully for both of those roles, um, we, I think we'll be able to, to reevaluate some of those services and expand them. Um, our our on-site book drops are now officially open 24 hours a day. That's a new, a new service um, that we quietly launched in uh, September. Uh, the last two weeks of August, we, we just toyed with the notion of not locking them at night to see if, if we uh, encountered any overages, and we did not. So we continued with that process, and um, so far our capacity for returns is, is fairly good. Um, from a circulation standpoint, um, at the very tail end of my director's report, I've got some year-to-year uh, -year comparative data in there for you. Um, I will say that what we're noticing there is our circulation, though, is going like gangbusters. I mean, you wouldn't believe that um, we are in a limited environment right now. Our circulation uh, from last year, um, we are only down 8% from last year, just given the environment that we're in. So with limited hours, uh, with, with far fewer people coming into the bu building physically, um, a lot of folks still taking advantage of parking lot pickup. Um, I would say we've got about 25 appointments a day that are booked for parking lot pickup. And then we've got a, a fair number of walk-ups as well where folks come just and just pull up on their own. Um, so uh, we're really we're really satisfied with um, with the numbers that we're seeing there. We're getting a lot of positive feedback from folks who are getting their resources. Um, another detail I wanted to share with you today too is uh, library card expirations. Um, I made the executive decision that we were not going to have any library card expirations in this fiscal year. Uh, as a procedure, library cards um, are due for renewal every three years. And early in the pandemic, we decided um, so that no one would lose access to any library services, especially our digital services, um, we, uh, we elected to automatically renew library cards. And um, we've continued that process. For whatever reason, some of them um, started to come due right here at, at the beginning of September. There were, there were I, I think, maybe 100 or so um, cards became suddenly expired on September 1. Uh, real bummer. We were, we were really disappointed to find that out um, because we thought we had a system in place to automatically renew those. Uh, we've worked with CCS. Uh, the staff has done a fabulous job and we've come up with a plan uh, to push every one of these renewal dates out one, one year from the date that they were going to be due. So if your card was going to expire today, September 15th, 2020, that, that renewal date is now September 15th, 2021. And we're doing that month over month through June um, to, to just kind of incrementally work through all of those renewal processes. And then we'll, we'll attend to those, you know, a year from now um, and follow up on that data there. So hopefully no one else falls through the cracks and loses library service, um, at least even temporarily. Um, we're still offering, it is library card sign up month and we're, we're still offering online uh, library card applications and encouraging folks to do that as well. Um, yeah. Any, any other questions or comments about um, our modified environment? Uh, Fina. 
I wanted to ask how, what's the comfort level? Are you feeling that people are less anxious? Staff is less anxious, you know, kind of coming in, you know, to work. I certainly feel less, less of it than, you know, of course, May or June, but let me, let me know your thoughts and the staff's thoughts. Yeah, I would say that generally um, staff is feeling more comfortable. Um, we did some additional modifications to our barriers, uh, the, uh, the plexiglass barriers that are at service desks. Um, we were, right after we opened, we found that some of the members of the public were trying to, you know, walk around the side of them to try to talk to us, you know, and so we, we put, you know, returns on them a little bit um, to try to help encourage folks to stay in front of the glass. Um, in general, no, I mean, I, I think staff are doing really great. As I mentioned early on, we have modified our hours, obviously. Um, the library uh, building itself is open to staff two hours before we open and two hours after we close. So for those folks um, who can conduct work um, like shelving, for example, or check-in of materials, a lot of activities that aren't time bound by a direct customer service, um, some staff are, are doing it that way. Um, and that's been good. Um, I would say, you know, it really, honestly, I mean, if you were to ask me this month, if staff were, were kind of anxious about things, it, it had something more to do with something that was at the top of our agenda, um, more of a safety matter than, than a health matter. But uh, for right now, I, I think staff are generally really good. Um, we've made some accommodations for folks who've requested them. Um, we do have a fair number of staff who are working a few of their hours a week um, outside of the building still, and that's generally working really well, actually. We feel pretty well connected. As I mentioned, um, we've implemented a new software system, Microsoft Teams, uh, that has actually made us far more connected than we were previously. So there, there are some advantages actually to this environment. It's kind of forced us to be a little bit more communicative with one another. We're certainly having more Zoom meetings than we ever did before. <laughs> All right, anything else related to that topic? If not, I will slide just, just into a, my report. Uh, oh, Dan, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just a quick one. So, yeah, I, I noticed the CTA book drop is still closed. Is that because we, we don't have any vehicle to pick it up and we, or we need the Pacifica? Or can you, you give me 15 seconds on that, please? Yeah, so um, Dan and I talked about this via email um, a while ago. Um, so the uh, the rationale behind um, the remote book drops remaining closed is partially a staffing situation. Um, we, we're, we're short staffed in our facilities department and that's made it a challenge for remote drops. Um, so I, I think we're gonna be able to, to proceed with this here shortly when our staffing shortfall is overcome. Um, just to be able to guarantee daily service of these remote drops has been a challenge. Um, and I think with the quarantine periods, there were, there were a number of issues there, but I think we, we're, we're kind of at a point now where I think we're gonna be able to accommodate this. And uh, certainly the addition of the vehicle is gonna facilitate that process. So I would hope that here um, in the next few weeks, we'll be able to reopen those remote drops and advertise that service. Thank you. Director's All right, report. nothing else. Yep, I'll move on to my report. Um, okay, oh, which so, you've already given us, so. Um, I'll try to keep it brief for you all. I mean, you, you've all got it here in front of you. Um, so um, going down the, the list, um, we had some really great programming in August in support of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Adult services staff did a great job with those two programs and they were very popular. Um, Nancy Wagner spearheaded those events primarily, and she also hosted a virtual series called Navigating the Job Search. That was a partnership um, with Skokie, Glenview, and Niles Main District Libraries. Um, that was a multi-week event, um, and it also goes hand in hand with some of our other job searching um, resources that we're offering right now. Um, we offer We've got a job search page, which provides a lot of passive information for folks, but we're also working with a consultant who will give a 30 minute career consultation. And we've gotten some really positive feedback about the folks who've taken advantage of that service. Um, so just be aware of, of that. Um, uh, our shelving manager, Patsy Devono, participated in a week long racial justice challenge that was hosted by the Folger Library at University of Maine. I've included some links in my packet about this. 
Um, it's really awesome. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to participate in this as well. I mean, obviously the live event portion of this is done, uh, but all the information is still live and you can take a self-guided course through this. Um, I, I think we're, she, Patsy's part of the equity, diversity, and inclusion committee at the library. And we're going to be resurrecting that community, uh, committee again here very shortly. And I think that that team is going to try to shepherd in some of the training that we've, uh, that she's incorporated from this, uh, uh, this plan, this, um, project that she just went through. Um, I have something else related to this that I, I would love to share with you right now, but I'm going to have to save it till next month. So stay tuned, but I've got some fun news to share with you soon. Um, there is a statement down here at the bottom that I, I do want to read to you all because I think this is an important piece of our collection uh, policy that I want you all to be aware of. Um, as our librarians are updating their bibliographic resources for the public, so our, our book lists, we're working on making them more diverse, representing Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the spectrum of abilities and gender identities. We're establishing goals of meeting a minimum percentage of titles with a main character from an underrepresented population. And depending on the topic, we are aiming for at least 25% of the books with diverse main characters, and some lists will have over 50% diverse main characters. Um, as we talked about earlier this spring with the selection of American Dirt as our one book title, we are also seeking out own voices titles as much as possible for our list as we go forward. Uh, this is part of our charge to try to create a more equitable, diverse, and inclusive collection and to try to promote those resources through our programming as well. Uh, this is going to be a big piece of what we do through our EDI committee and um, it underscores uh, the staff's commitment to ensuring equity uh, in our collections. Um, as far as the collections go, as I said earlier, our ebook um, usage is still going very strong. Um, we're showing 65% uh, increases in ebook usage even since the library has reopened. Um, we, we know that our circulation in physical material, as I said, is really strong, but digital continues to boom. Um, we've got a lot of new users who are taking advantage of, of the Libby app and, and have given us really positive feedback about the collections there. Um, we have increased our spending um, because we've got the budget now to support that. Thank you for your support of that. Um, so we're making more investments there uh, to promote those collections. Um, we've also enhanced a lot of our online learning and continuing education resources. Um, we've got a bunch of new databases that are listed. So if you go to our online uh, learning resource page, um, you can see that. It's also highlighted on our back to school uh, email that was sent out to the community as well as the back to school um, page that's posted on the front page of our website right now. Um, as I mentioned that we've got year to date resource statistics for digital resources as well as our print collections um, appended to my packet. I wanted to give you an update on the RFID process because I, I mentioned in the technical services update that we're expecting to see um, a little bit more withdrawal of, of uh, print materials here in the coming months as staff are preparing to tag the collections. We certainly don't want to tag things that we're not going to need. Uh, so staff um, in adult services in particular have begun an extensive weeding project there. Today was the, uh, the day that we were delivering um, answers to questions that uh, the vendors on the RFID project had posed to us last week. Uh, so those were all posted up. I think we have five prospective bidders on the RFID project. Uh, that project is, um, the proposals are due on the 30th, so just two weeks from now. And uh, then we'll go through and review those, um, those bids and make a recommendation to you all and hopefully we'll get approval at the October meeting to proceed with that activity. Uh, so we'll give you updates about that um, as we go through the course of the next month. Uh, the next section of my report was all dedicated to youth services, and I think Andrea did a great job summarizing that. Uh, there was one piece that we did leave out in that, and that was the adult services participation um, in the Summer Reading Club. Um, so I, I will just give a, a, a brief shout out to that. Um, we had 165 adults that completed the reading club this year by listening or reading four books from four different genres of their choosing. Um, and that is actually more than we've had uh, participate in the past. So the digital component or the uh, remote version of this online club this year was actually really favorable for adults. So I think that will continue to be an offering that we're going to do going forward uh, with the summer reading club for that crowd. Um, 
we added an express uh, computer station to the reference area to help um, with some of the bottlenecking that's taking place in the computer room. Uh, computer use activity has still been very strong since we've reopened. That was a service that the public greatly missed. Um, what else can I tell you? We've got a postcard that we're going to send out to homes here. You should be receiving it um, potentially this week. Uh, so check your mailbox. This is intended to be kind of an evergreen uh, tool that you can put up on your, your refrigerator and remind you about what the resources are that the library is providing um, right now. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we got a couple pictures that I shared with you all in my report from a local photographer that we've been working with to try to enhance our communications with social media and on the website. Um, she got some really great photos, so we're excited to share that um, with you all. And um, as I mentioned at the top um, of this conversation, we've seen a little bit of turnover in staff and we've got two very key roles in our management that are going to be uh, hopefully filled here in October and I'll share more information with you as soon as I can share that, uh, those details with you. Um, I'm gonna pause there and uh, see if you've got any questions for me. Uh, Fina. Anthony, I was wondering if there's any been, has there been any um, updates on any local news, um, like the Wilmot Beacon used to be for us. They were a nice partner with us in getting you know, communication out, getting events, you know, the dates, you know, every week they had something, you know, what's coming up this week. And oftentimes a lot of the uh, library events were included there. Um, Alexa Burnett yeah. used to do great, great coverage, even articles of, of you know, the, the library's events. Has there been any update on whether we're going to have some type of Wilmette news uh, paper or you know, online news, news venue. Yes. Yes, um, I was contacted um, within the last two weeks by um, the managing editor of The Record, which is going to be um, a new Trier Township um, based newspaper. So it will cover the whole township rather than just specifically Wilmette like The Beacon did. Um, this is affiliated with 22nd Century Media, which is the same, um, uh, group that that was uh, that ran the beacon as well as a number of other newspapers in suburban Chicagoland. Um, I know that they, I think that they're they're going to be running a strictly online model, from what I understand, and I anticipate that that they're going to be launching sometime in October. They're going to run Anthony? both as a service as well hey, I'm, as. Uh, I'm yeah, sorry to interrupt. I I happen to be a backer of them, so. Um, it's a, um, a new nonprofit organization uh, that, you know, raised 60 grand. It's just going to be online. But yeah, it is the North Shore record. I just wanted to clarify. They, they all used to work for the 22nd uh, Media Company, but they, they started their own new nonprofit organization. Um, so it should be great. Should be, I think they're aiming for September 30. So sorry to interrupt. Okay. So, um, so I did speak with the editor and um, established a relationship there. Um, he's new to us, so um, we wanted to make sure that we, we, we met. Um, we were on each other's distribution list, so all of our communications that we would send out to uh, the Beacon will now be sent over to uh, the North Shore Record. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments for me? No. Um, Anthony, I have a quick question. Do you remember, it might have been um, when you spoke about widening the distribution of our Wi-Fi into the parking lot and in, onto the green. Um, has that ever, and I think Stuart, you brought up a good question. How will that be, how will the community be alerted? I think it was a wonderful idea. Has anything else, has that come to fruition or um, any, um, uh, PR or, or any um, marketing on that? Um, PR and marketing, um, I guess the answer to that is no. Um, yes, it has been implemented. Um, I, I think we discussed this at the last meeting. It was launched in early August. Um, we have a, a radio that's, that's mounted um, just above Stuart's right ear. Um, so <laughs> if you look on the green there, um, <laughs> 
um, right on the side of the window, oh, um, just to the just to the left of the Wilmet Library name, there's a radio in that window, and it get, it does broadcast out to the lawn. Yep, you got it, Stuart. Yeah. Right there, perfect. <laughs> um, so there's one there, and then there are two that are um, along the north side of the building um, that are feeding into the parking lot. And um, we do have a number of folks that actually do use the park benches that are out on the, the north side of the building. And I frequently see people sitting there with their iPads, assuming that they're connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, and I've observed that outside of library hours. So um, the Wi-Fi is always on. Folks can connect to that service anytime, 24-7. Could that be posted on our website? I mean, I'm, I, where I'm thinking, I don't know if in our community, but if kids needed a stronger Wi-Fi, they could come and sit outside, you know, whether any Nutria kids or uh, Loyola kids or, or anything like that. Again, I think it's terrific. And I just would hope that the community is aware of it. Yes, um, we can certainly do that. There's also um, a website that is that was created for um, the underserved and unserved, talking about what libraries are offering services like this. It's kind of a, a directory or index of libraries that are offering um, Wi-Fi services outside of their buildings. And um, we've updated our holding in there to include that we've expanded our, our reach um, so that you can access the internet outside of the building. So. Um, so that's, that is getting broadcast to other folks and even outside of our community. Um, but yes, we can add that to our website, Joan. That'd be great. Thank you. Any other questions okay. for Director Austin? Okay, moving to committee reports. Trustee Barshis, Illinois Library Association. Mm -hmm. Well. As most of you know, the Illinois Library Association is having its conference this year from October 20 to 22, and our own Dr. Ronald Rogers is being honored as trustee of the year with the award. The selection is done in the blind. I just want to give you a few pointers about it. Uh, in other words, when people apply, their names are deleted so that the uh, uh, committee doesn't know who the person is. So they look over all the information and uh, the, this is the executive board and the name of the nominee is not known until the selection is finally made. Um, I'd just like to run through what Ron and other recipients of the award have had to do in their past in order to be selected. Contributions to local library systems, activities, and involvement at the state and national level. Years of service, offices, different positions, committees, and accomplishments, notable leadership qualities, and any other relevant information. So it's quite a laundry list, and I'm sure we all congratulate Ron on this very prestigious award. That's it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, Rails. Um, I don't have any update. I would just say um, check out the, um, the resource page on COVID-19 for updates on the Rails page as listed mm -hmm. on the agenda. Okay. And now in terms of communication, you see the information items. I don't think we need to go over them in terms of the ILA conference communication. Right. right. <laughs> so, new business. Oh, well, I've okay. got it. So um, you all got a doodle. You, uh, there are three things. You all have received a doodle poll. And so uh, for the next finance committee, where we need to set the levy, start looking at the levy. So I hope you all will fill that out. You've got quite a few options. Um, the League of Women Voters is hosting a um, webinar, two webinars, and it's to encourage members and community members to run for office. So I'll be representing uh, Wilmette Public Library on the 23rd of September from 7 to 8 p.m. It'll be by Zoom. And then we received a letter, Anthony and I, from uh, Beth Drucker, president of Go Green Wilmette, 
in terms of uh, their solar initiative and encouraging us to well, uh, inviting us to participate in it. Uh, I will forward it to you, but uh, Anthony wrote her and I also wrote her because I think for the next two years, our focus will be on those two areas that were uh, basically in the capital reserve study that are dealing with life safety, life safety and building integrity. Mm -hmm. You have anything else to add, Anthony? Yeah, I, I guess the point that I would add here is that um, one of the contingencies of, of implementing a solar panel system on the roof of the library is, is the uh, completion of the roof re uh, replacement, uh, roof maintenance project. Um, I think we, we, should, we should take care of that task first before we go to the, the trouble of installing a new solar panel system because we would have to dismantle that solar panel system to address any of the roof issues. Um, First, you know, so I, I guess I would I would say, you know, let's let's fix the roof and then uh, make sure that everything is is done correctly, that we don't have any leaks and then we can put in a solar panel panel system. Um, but I completely support it. Um, I'll reach out to Beth and um, she contacted us uh, yesterday about this. Um, I will contact her and uh, we'll discuss it a little bit more about what our options are and uh, we can um, we can invite her to a meeting to uh, to share more details with us and what options are available to the library. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also wonder if in doing the renovations that we're going to have to do on our roof, um, if the people who are coming from the organization to help do that would have just any suggestions about the addition of solar. Not that we would do it now, but just that we might be able to find out some good information about what the roofs can and can't do while they're working on them. Yeah, I can certainly engage with Joe and his group about that um, to talk about yep. feasibility and you know, so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll look into that. Great, thanks. And then finally, you all got notices, uh, and we talked about it last month, but hope everybody has sent in the uh, audit question from the auditor that was sent to you all in the mail about a month ago. Yeah. Is there any other new business? Old business. Justina? Trustee Riddle? Um, uh, I was part of the, um, I'm part of the, as part of the audit committee, I was part of a um, brief audit over the minutes. Um, uh, about a month ago, I want to say, and it made me realize I wanted to ask if we could schedule I don't know who schedules the audit committee, but I think it'd be worth scheduling something, especially in light of um, some of the, the inquiries that we all had to respond to. Um, so is it possible? I'm, I don't know how I go about do, you know, sending out a doodle, but is it possible to also send out? What would be the purpose of it? Just curious. Um, to go over the board minute um, short review that we did and also because I think we haven't, I, I don't think we have met yet this year. The audit committee generally in the past has never met. Generally there are two people that review it and it's for the um, form that was sent in last to say that they're complete. There generally hasn't been any reason to review it because they are approved and it's to make sure they're all in order with the attachments. I've never looked at an audit policy. I, I'm not aware of that. Sorry, well, we I just, talk, I, I, was a, I was assigned to the committee. So right. maybe we could talk about that off offline. Okay, Joan, you wanted to say something? Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I did it. It's, it's a, I think it's the two list, um, newest members that are part of that. And, and I, my understanding was it was um, to be sure that everything was in order and we signed then a form that says everything's in order, everything has been signed and, and so forth, that then is submitted. So I don't think there's really a committee necessary to talk about that. It's just my, as my experience that you just do what needs to be done. And, and I, and because sometimes things, uh, you know, for whatever inadvertently don't get signed. 
So, but I don't know if there's necessary. There was a statute copied um, in the board packet binder. Um, and I wrote it down. It said 1630 to 65 section C. And um, it said that the report of the audit committee shall be made part of the secretary's records. And so that's what I'm not sure of. What records does the secretary keep on the on our audit and on the board minutes? And I, you know, we did take notes. I did take notes and I left notes. I don't know who I report that to. So maybe we could talk about it offline. That's kind of why I wanted to meet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, the function. Are, have the any of you been committee. members of the audit committee yeah. before? All of us have been members. Oh, okay. At some point, because I did it last year because I think you weren't able to get to it. So, and it's just to make sure that it has to be reviewed by two members. And then it stated that they it was reviewed because it goes on to the, I forget the form that we approved last month requires that it, those minutes be audited. The annual report to the state library is where it's required. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't recall, you know, I haven't looked at that in a while, but I don't recall that the statutory specification for it, it's in the requirements for eligibility for the um, capita grant. Okay, I can show it to you offline. We can go over that offline. Okay, thank you. Any other business, new or old? I'll motion to adjourn. Okay, and is there a second? There's a second. Okay, Trustee Wolf has moved to close the meeting and Trustee Barshish has seconded the motion and is and this is at 751. Can we have a voice vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And Fina, I'll get with you and Anthony and I'll get with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Everybody stay well. Good night. Yeah, Tomorrow's going to be 80 degrees. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for a well-run meeting. Okay, so yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be careful looking Bye. at the sun, by the way. <laughs>